so I'm going to look at these issues from a slightly more uh, climate change orientated perspective. Um, I'm actually now working for the National Economic and Social Council, which uh, we have a remit to look at Ireland's climate, climate change policy in the period 2020. So um, I'm going to be looking at kind of retrofit slightly through the lens of, of climate change policy more so than energy efficiency policy like St. John did. And just a brief overview of what I'm going to look at. Well, first of all, the challenge for Ireland, um, and I'm going to be specifically focusing on our residential sector. And then, as I said, looking maybe a little bit at government policy and targets, particularly in the area of climate change policy. And then I'm going to be looking at some of the work I've done in the area of deep retrofit uh, with the IIEA. And that will be touching on some of the PAYS issues, which uh, Sinjin teed up for me. And then identifying five different policy options to overcome the financing barrier, which we've identified in our research. And then some outstanding issues to be overcome in a very general kind of sense. So I suppose the challenge for Ireland in the residential sector is um, we've got an extremely poorly performing uh, residential housing stock. And if you compare this to any other European country, um, you know, luckily uh, we've built our buildings very poorly, but that obviously gives us an opportunity because there's a lot of cost effective um, abatement potential, as we call it in climate change, or energy efficiency improvement potential, if you, if you like, in our building stock. Um, and this is just using the we'll say the period of construction as a, as a proxy for identifying the BER of our housing stock. Um, but I think, you know, to generally the audience here will be more than aware of this uh, issue. Just to say also that we now have 280,000 BER certs. So our guesswork, um, the period of guesswork is coming to an end and we're getting a clearer and clearer indication of, you know, exactly how poorly performing our residential housing stock is. The BER database obviously um, will be more associated with newer houses and houses that have had retrofits. So it's not exactly representative of the housing stock, but it will give us a clearer and clearer idea. And I think that generally the findings are being borne out, you know, um, that these, uh, that, you know, that this uh, period of construction is generally a fairly decent indicator of the quality of our housing stock. Um, again, I'm not going to rehash. I think this is a very well accepted argument at this point now that if you look at it from a climate change perspective, and this is just a chart which shows the cost effectiveness of mitigating CO2 um, in, our, in our building, uh, in the built environment sector alone. And what you can see is anything that's under the line, essentially that means that it pays, it pays in energy terms to save energy from, the, um, from our building stock, both commercial, industrial, and residential. Um, what I would say about this curve is, this is based on $120 oil and, um, what we know now, uh, I was actually at a presentation, I'm going to go on a slight digression here. We were at a, I was at a presentation in the IEA with uh, the IMF recently, and essentially the, the lead researcher in the IMF has built a new model for predicting future oil price. And would you believe that how we predicted future oil price in the past was essentially we had a demand component, and we assumed an unlimited response, so no supply constraint to that demand. So this is the economic, if there's any economists in the room, uh, this is, you know, we actually went through, you know, hundreds of years of civilization, and up until this IMF model, that was essentially how we predicted our future oil price. And what the IMF are now doing is saying, yes, that is a really important component of it. Demand is a hugely important component, but looking at the sort of peak oil type um, proponents, and integrating a sort of a, a bottom-up supply constraint component into that. And without going into the details, essentially what the, their baseline projection for oil price in the period 2020 is a doubling of the oil price between now and 2020. So anything, any bit of research we've done, anything on the cost of abatement, um, anything on what we should and shouldn't be doing from a cost effectiveness perspective is really turned on its head if you take those uh, projections at face value. So what are our emissions reductions targets? Well, essentially, we've got to reduce our emissions on a 2005 baseline in agriculture, buildings, and transport by 20%. I'm simplifying here a little bit. But suffice it to say that um, agriculture and transport are not very easy to mitigate emissions from. So the weight of that legally binding target, which we will get fined for if we don't achieve, is going to be borne by the, the residential sector. And essentially, what we've been asked by the Minister for Environment in NESC to look at is how we you know, how are we going to meet our target? Right now, the projections suggest that we're miles off meeting our target. So we have to sort of come up with new ideas about how we might meet our target. And hopefully, I'll draw on some of the initial kind of research uh, that we've been undertaking in that area. And Duncan, you'll keep me on time if I, uh, as soon as I started speaking, I realized that I was going through these a bit slower than I thought. So um, 
So I suppose what I find really interesting, if you take out the residential sector, and I'm just going to be talking about the residential sector today, this is kind of, there's, there's, there's basically, up until 2010 is the trend, so that's emissions or energy use, you can say if you like, emissions are just a proxy for, for energy use, well, excluding renewables. If you look at that, up until 2010 is the latest year we have data. So even since 2005, despite the economic recession, despite everything that's been going on, energy use in the residential sector or emissions in the residential sector have been increasing. Now, of course, there's been some very severe winters, et cetera, and that does have to be taken into consideration. But what I find really interesting is when we start doing the projections, all of a sudden our emissions from the residential sector go off a cliff. So everything that's happened beforehand is kind of bad, if you like. Everything that's going to happen in the future is good. Now, there are very good reasons for that, and, you know, St. John's uh, Better Energy Program is the primary reason why we uh, see this kind of tra trajectory emerging. So I suppose it's just to say that, you know, policy really needs to be flipped on its head. It hasn't quite happened yet. There's a lot of really good things happening, but they haven't taken effect yet. So to actually make things, these things happen is the, is the real challenge. Getting on to the energy efficiency, as St. John said, we've got a 20% energy saving target. Um, what that means for better energy, which is our whole retrofit program across the whole economy, commercial, industrial, and residential buildings, is 8,000 gigawatt hours saved. So St. John will uh, tell you where the, how this 8,000 gigawatt hour figure came about. In our first National Energy Efficiency Action Plan, we had a gap to target of 8,000 gigawatt hours. So we said, well, better energy, let's hope that can deliver 8,000 8, gigawatt hours. Um, I'm being slightly facetious, but that is more or less how it happened. So an interesting question is, well, what is the actual potential for abatement in the residential sector in the period of 2020. And there's some UCD research in this area, and essentially what they're saying is that if you take the one million, tar if you take 800,000 homes, and, sorry, could I just get my water here? <laughs> so if you take 800,000 homes, and uh, you focus retrofits on the poor, most poorly performing homes, and you just retrofit a little bit deeper than we're doing at the moment. You don't have to revolutionize it, you just have to go a little bit deeper, that you could actually get energy savings of 11,884 uh, gigawatt hours. So, you know, nearly del the target for the residential sector at the moment is 5,200 gigawatt hours. Of the 8,000, 5,200 is supposed to be delivered in the, in the residential sector. And so if we really believe the 800,000 target or the 1 million homes target, and we're saying, yes, we actually think we could reach 100,000 homes per year or 80,000 homes per year. It's not actually that difficult at all to ensure that the average spend is 5,000 instead of 3,000. At the moment, the average spend per retrofit is 3,000. If we wanted to go to 5,000, 8,000, that's not actually that difficult. The, big, the difficult bit is obviously the 800,000 homes. That's the actual really difficult bit. And I don't see why policy couldn't be designed where we're encouraging, and this is already happening, by the way, and you know, I'm not saying anything here that you know, St. John and the you know, excellent people in SEAI aren't aware of, but you know, it's the sort of the idea of bundling of measures, providing financing to overcome that financing barrier, and you know, you really can get, you might be able to get to a properly deep retrofit, but you can at least get to a significantly deeper retrofit. So, um, as I said, I'm, I'm sort of jumping around a little bit here, but you know, at the moment, the SEAI program, as St. John said, we've reached 200,000 homes. The average spend is 3,000 3, euro. That's including the grant, which is about 40%. So the average spend is about 1,700 euro um, per, per intervention. <coughs> so it's just an interesting question, the extent to which, you know, at the moment, external insulation is, is only a tiny fraction of, and everybody knows that external insulation is probably where we need to be going, where we need to be targeting. Cavity wall insulations are running out. They're not gonna be that available. Um, you know, this really is the, the big kind of clincher. This is the big lumpy one in the middle, and if we don't kind of get people doing this, really kind of, you know, you can forget about your 5,200 gigawatt hours, not to mention your, your uh, 12,000 gigawatt hours. Um, so the, on the 3,000 uh, spend, you're getting average savings of about 20%-ish. 
And what's interesting now is that SEAI have started to, um, SEA, their actual analysis of their programs is, I was in actually meeting them yesterday, and the work they're doing on analyzing their programs is absolutely world class. It's really fantastic. And what they've started to do now is not just guess, use deep to guess how much savings are going to accrue. They're actually doing some ex post analysis of the impact of measures. And the, these findings, it's, it's really encouraging from a policy perspective that the findings in the ex post analysis is coming out the same as the ex ante stuff. So it just means that we're not all, we're not all stuck with our heads in the clouds, imagining that you know, what you know, could happen if something else happened. We've got actual data now to prove that this is actually something that's saving people's money, saving people more money than the upfront cost of investment, et cetera, et cetera. So the real question then is, well, what kind of, what's a deep retrofit and what's a, deep, what's a deeper retrofit or what's a deep retrofit? And is it really cost effective? And so this is getting back to this thinker, thinking deeper research that we conducted um, towards the middle of last year. And I suppose essentially on this very, very, very simplistic basis, without, in the, without projecting any future increase in oil prices or anything like that, essentially what we said is, what you see here is um, different packages of deep retrofits. And generally, you know, we, we're, we're saying that a deep retrofit is you know, 40% plus. Really in Germany, a deep retrofit would be 80% energy savings. But we were saying that it would be about 40%. And we were saying that the cost range of a deep retrofit, depending on the building, would probably be between five and 25 grand. So when we're talking about financing, that's the kind, those are the kind of figures that we need to be thinking, you know, how can we get these kind of packages of finance into the market? And essentially, as I said, on our very simplistic analysis, the black figures here um, over on the, in the second last column, I don't think I circled anything, no. <laughs> uh, the red ones are the ones that aren't that essentially you don't get a um, you don't get a, a cash a positive cash flow from. So what we were saying is essentially if you're if you if you've got finance at 20 years and the interest rate is 10 percent, you know you go into red. Uh, so a 20 year payback, you don't generate a positive cash flow. But what you can see is there's a lot of black over here, especially if you're talking about closer to mortgage finance levels. So at mortgage finance levels, deep retrofit is really attractive to consumers if they've got a spreadsheet in their head. <laughs> um, <laughs> which most consumers don't, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, you know, so I suppose the case is theoretically this works. Theoretically this should work, even right now, even with deeper retrofits. E you know, if we can get the finance in place at the right level, theoretically it works, and the rest is about sort of overcoming uh, the, the barriers. And so what are the, the barriers? Uh, so we, we talked specifically about the financial barrier, and there's all sorts of barriers that feed into the financial barrier, but we felt that the financial barrier was worth kind of a study in its own right, if you like. And what we discovered was that um, Paul and his friends uh, in the banks um, don't particularly like this. It's not really something that fits into their, you know, into their, their way of analyzing or working with things. So primarily because there's no track record. It's, it, we're, asking people, we're asking banks to take a shot in the dark here. There's no real reliable data. When I uh, went to do this, the, looking at what was the return on deep retrofits, I mean, there are no deep retrofits. There, there are deep retrofits in Ireland, but there's no studies of them. There's no monitors. There's no um, proof that the energy savings are achieved. You know, so, I mean, how are you supposed to expect banks to take a punt on something like that when you're saying to them, look, if we put all these measures into a house, we get a 60% energy saving, which equals X percent in terms of, um, you know, cash, which means that we'll be able to pay back, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there's no real data there. Like, we, we're pretty sure that that is the case, but, you know, you, we can't really prove it yet. I mean, in Germany, they've got, they started to do these um, pilot studies, and it, the, the information looks very positive, but again, no real no real data on the future energy savings. And because they're in the future, we don't know what's going to happen with energy prices. We don't know what's going to happen. There's so much uncertainty, so it's just not very easy to sell it to the banks. And anyway, retail banks generally have very limited balance sheets. And they depend on borrowing from capital markets to finance projects. They really prefer five to seven year, you know, that's why car loans are very popular with the banks if you've got, you know, a decent credit rating, because it's really kind of handy for them to charge a high interest rate over a short term. And, you know, that's really where they, you know, um, Paul can correct me on all of this after, <laughs> afterwards, um, because this is really just to be, on the basis of our research. You know, we, did a lot, we looked into a, a lot of the international research on the financing barrier, and these were the kind of things that came up. Um, and so then there's all sorts of other barriers, but the other, the other side, so that's the supply side. On the demand side, consumers don't get it. Does that mean I'm finished now? 
No, will do. We're no problem. Time for the and so, as Sinjin mentioned, uh, the, the real the direction of policy is towards um, this better energy program, which kind of moves away from grants and puts the onus on energy suppliers and the obligation on energy suppliers to deliver these retrofits. And this is already happening. We're, we're in the middle of this transition now. But as Sinjin said, the danger is that we'll fall off a cliff um, if we assume that pays is going to make, take up all the slack um, from, from the removal of grants. We looked at five different financing options. Um, Sinjin discussed one and two. Uh, the green bank issue is, uh, is just really an, a way of getting over the supply side issues that I mentioned. Um, leveraging private savings is probably what Paul was talking about. Unfortunately, I missed his presentation. But the idea of there's lots of <laughs> I've seen it before, though. I read the PowerPoints. Um, there's lots of um, there's lots of savings on, you know, in credit unions, et cetera, in Ireland, and how do you tap those and access those? And it's related to the fact that the target market for deep retrofit is this sort of silver surfer group. So elderly people, they're, they're basically one or two top priorities are improvements, home improvements. So it's about, you can either directly incentivize people through savings, so you, um, or else you can, you can attract that funding in, indirectly into a fund. Um, but we looked, if anyone is interested in discussing those options or reading more about them, they're in our report, Thinking Deeper, which is available on the IEA website. So just my last slide, Duncan, you'll be happy uh, to know. Uh, so what I think are the main problems, um, Sinjin has his head around this a lot better than I do because I'm looking at it from an external theoretical perspective. He's got his hand on the um, actual um, institutional wheel there and he's trying to make this happen. But you know, when we were doing our uh, piece of research, certainly the attracting capital at attractive rates, if you want to pass that on to the consumer to keep it lower to mortgage capital rather than car financing is a key thing. We did a lot of focus group research, uh, which is also included in the, in the report, and we found that consumers really think of pays the whole idea of pays is it's not attached to you. It's attached to your property or to the energy meter. This is not more personal debt. Right now, consumers are extremely debt averse, and they will not conscience. They're, they're, people are interested in paying off debts, not taking out more debts. That's a massive kind of phenomenon right now in, 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 in the Irish consumer's mind. So the whole marketing and the whole packaging of this has to be around Get moving away from that idea that this is more personal debt. This has absolutely nothing to do with you. This is attached to your house, and when you move house, it stays with your house. Do consumers believe that? No, not at the moment. Um, so sustaining retrofit activity, we, we did. I think the main problem here is overcoming the can't do mentality you know, in Irish society. And no matter who you talk to, and there, as Sinjin said, there are so many stakeholders involved in this process. You know, it, it is extremely difficult, it is extremely challenging, but it's made more challenging by, you know, various regulatory authorities and, you know, stakeholders, etc. just going to, we don't want to, um, you know, we don't want to get involved in this. So I'll leave, leave it at that. Thank you very much.